So my name is Michael McMahon, and I've come up with a little side project called Hackers and Hospitals. Uh, I'd like to tell you about it. Let's see. Uh, who am I? I am uh, the web developer at the Free Software Foundation since January 2019. Uh, I have a varied background uh, ranging from game design, manufacturing, education, music. Uh, all of that's with a focus on free software and uh, free culture licenses. Um, I got into 3D printing at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, I got a rep wrap uh, probably around 2014. And um, it took me about 40 hours to figure out how it worked. But after that, I was teaching kids daily how to design uh, simple objects, uh, mostly toys. But uh, at one point, a kid broke his headphones. Uh, it was a piece a um, little above the ear. And the whole thing wouldn't work without it. So we took a good look at it and drafted up a replacement part in an afternoon. We were able to print the thing that day, and then he was able to use his headphones again. Um, now, that's not really amazing or world-changing, but the, the ability to do that um, with additive manufacturing, rapid prototyping, 3D printing, that's really incredible. Um, I was using a proprietary and free program at the time. And I had to figure out a new way to do things now. So lockdown happened um, in many places around the world. And I gave the call out to all the people that I knew with 3D printers. I said, go to your school, go to your work, wherever you have 3D printers, if you know how to use them, get them, take them, put them in your house or your garage or wherever you can put them. Um, I was able to get our RYF printers. RYF is the Respects Your Freedom program at the FSF. Um, the only brand that has passed this uh, rigorous certification in the 3D printing world is Lulzbot. So I set up a, a Lulzbot Mini, um, TAS 6, uh, an AO100, and uh, AO101, and a uh, a mini two, my garage. Uh, there's a picture of the mini two. Uh, it's a, a tricky thing with the lockdown. Um, I went with a teacher friend of mine that I will not name, and uh, we got the printers uh, from her her classroom. And on the way out, we were packing everything up, and uh, somebody said. You guys need to drop what you're doing and leave the building right now. You've contaminated the whole building. And that's that's a pretty ridiculous thing to say, but um, we just grabbed everything that we could and left. Uh, I believe a lot of people weren't able to do such a thing. Um, so a lot of these uh, hobbyist manufacturing tools are just sitting in locked buildings at this point. Uh, this is a picture of my basement. Uh, I have the uh, Lulzbot Mini printing some parts. Uh, I was using a proprietary program, and I had to figure out how to go about doing this um, using free software. So it was on my bucket list, learn how to use OpenSCAD. Um, kind of scared me because um, it's not point and click. Um, you have to use code to design shapes. Um, but I just opened it up, opened a couple um, example files, looked at the code, and it wasn't actually that hard. Um, so this is a modification of one of the examples. Um, which was licensed under CC0. 
uh, so the purpose of this was to uh, split ventilators. Now, I'm not a, a lawyer or a doctor. I don't know if that's a good idea still. Um, many people have criticized it. Um, but it's a, a complex thing. If we can do it safely, it would be cool to extend the usage of ventilators. Um, each split would need uh, several parts to make it safe. Uh, monitoring becomes the issue. Uh, you have to monitor each patient, uh, whereas normally the ventilator just monitors one person. So this would be a part of that system. I'm not sure if it's a good idea still. But uh, this was my attempt at helping out. Um, so this is the third revision. Uh, the part takes about three hours to print. And once I got it to this point, I started printing it myself. And I realized that the design is imperfect. Uh, you need uh, scaffolding on the inside and the outside and a raft to get the, the bottom right. Um, so the design wasn't very good, but I still left it up as a, a way to freely license a part. Um, I license it under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. And um, I later found a part that uh, was the same goal, but they actually figured out how to print it. Um, so this is the LRT ventilator splitter. Uh, you can download it from the NIH website. Still not sure if it's a, a good idea or not, but uh, here's a picture that they have uh, of it actually connected to a ventilator. Uh, good part about this design is that it doesn't need these um, scaffolding. Scaffolding is just a very thin piece of plastic that hold up parts, uh, either internally or externally. So this is my part. Um, to get it printed, I had to print it on its side. And it, there's all this residue from the, uh, the scaffolding. It's, it's porous. Uh, it's no good. This is the part the LRT, and it's great. I printed it in one piece. Um, I can uh, cover one end, blow, um, holds air. Uh, and the good part about it is that it's, um, it's the right size to fit these hoses. The hoses are usually 22 millimeter standard oxygen hoses. And if you get it right, um, they can connect together to split off as many times as you want. Um, again, I'm not sure if that's a good idea, but I've seen a video of somebody splitting it seven ways. Um, that was the first thing I tried. Uh, then my uh, wife's clinic was complaining about the, the straps on the masks. Um, they weren't used to wearing the masks all day, every day. So uh, these little comfort straps or ear helpers um, seem to be a really easy way for anyone with a small printer to help out. So I found this design. It's uh, approved by the NIH for clinical use. And it, it's very simple. It just goes behind the head. Um, there's a two designs in that STL file. There's a straight one as shown, and there's a curved one. Now, when you put this into a slicing program, this is Cura, which um, is shipped with LulzBot. Because the two designs are in one file, you can only put about two uh, or four total on the print bed at once. Um, there might be a way to split it off in Cura, but I couldn't figure it out. So I had to figure out how to make this more efficient. So I couldn't figure it out with uh, OpenSCAD. I had to learn something new. So I found FreeCAD. 
I was able to uh, import the STL file, turn it into a shape, um, put a block on, uh, covering up one, and then uh, merging those two shapes into uh, just one. So this is the curved one only. And then I was able to export it as an STL file again. Uh, this is the straight one only. Um, so once I split it, I was able to fit much more of them on the bed at once. Um, so this is uh, about six an hour um, when you're printing them. And so over a course of two days, I was able to make a lot of 75 of them. Um, now my next step is to find a local hospital uh give them the 75 and see if they like it if they like it i will print more and give them to them so i got this idea from from sean uh on um, every year we have a, a conference called libra planet and uh that's where i met sean he's talked there before so um uh, I sent him an email about the website, and uh, we got to talking, and we scheduled a talk, and uh, he, was, he had to cancel one night because he was working on printing things for the hospitals. And I said, that's a great idea. Hackers and hospitals. So I want to make a public resource. Uh, I'm not the only resource on this. Um, there are several, uh, many different platforms. Um, some are closed systems. Some are non-free, um, Facebook groups, uh, Slack channels, so forth. Uh, I want to make something that's public and that anyone could edit. So uh, the FSF has a wiki. It's a media wiki called Libra Planet. And it's for um, glugs to get together, um, organize, post things that they're working on. Uh, there's a couple other uses for it. Uh, people are using it for uh, free firmware research. Um, it's a cool place. Uh, and it's perfect for this project. Um, so there's, there's several different ways to uh, help out with it. Um, I, s I split it into four categories. Participation. Uh, participate needs, resources, and efforts. So the, the basic idea is that in order to tackle this uh, pandemic, using um, free culture, designing, and so forth, we need to kind of have a change of business as usual. I've seen a lot of manufacturing companies, engineering firms, biomedical industries uh, try to work on this uh, the normal way that they have in the past, um, privately, by themselves, in small teams. And then when they have something, they'll release it. And sometimes they'll just release it, like, here's an STL file that you can print yourself. Um, and I've seen that backfire in a number of ways. Um, I think iterations are the most important part. Um, it is okay to be wrong as long as you say that this is a work in progress, um, that you're not sure if it's done, uh, this is a release candidate only. Um, that's what I did with my, um, my open SCAD part. Um, as soon as I had something that looked like the part I was trying to get, I released it as release candidate one, RC1. Um, it, it wasn't any good, but it, a friend of mine, Robert, he was able to print it, um, connect it to itself. Um, so that's, that's good enough. Uh, but we just have to be uh, mindful of this. Um, and you have to be willing to make mistakes as long as you are willing to go back and fix them. Um, second section is uh, needs. 
Uh, this is a list of hospitals that I've found that are actively asking for help. Um, most of it, it, most of our, the hospitals on the list are from Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, but it's, I'm sure there's uh, thousands of other hospitals that are looking for help. The key is to stay local. If you're not in New England, um, don't bother with this list. Reach out to the hospitals that are in your area. Uh, I'm sure that they need some help in some way. Um, and don't, um, don't produce things that aren't needed. Um, you got to make sure that uh, the hospital wants what you're producing. Otherwise, you're just wasting a bunch of plastic or uh, fabric or whatever. Um, oftentimes, the hospital will want sewn masks. Sewn masks are the most common one. Um, and they'll even list the design that they want you to use. Um, some of these are uh, really complex, and some of them are very simple. Uh, I've listed uh, several in the resources section. But they'll usually tell you what they want. And if they don't know, um, now you have some designs that you can bring to them. So the, the trick to this list is based on Richard Stallman's Four Essential Freedoms. Um, now this is uh, written for software. And this project extends beyond software. Um, it can involve software. Um, OpenSCAD, free, uh, FreeCAD, those are both um, free software programs. Um, I've seen uh, Arduino code that can run uh, ventilators. Um, that's freely licensed um, under uh, the GPL. Um, this is uh, a verbose list. Um, it can be abbreviated. Uh, the FSFE, uh, Free Software Foundation Europe, has abbreviated it down to use, study, share, and improve. If you can do those four things with the design, um, I'm calling it free. Um, if it's not software, that's typically called free culture. Um, I'm not going to get into the specific licenses that I think do and don't um, apply to this. But um, I would stay away from the non-commercial, non-derivative licenses of the Creative Commons. Uh, but there are several Creative Commons licenses that are great. Uh, there are several resources uh, listed on this website. Um, the first section is personal protective equipment, PPE. And the first section is ones that are reviewed for clinical use by the uh, National Institute of Health, NIH. Um, I've listed them from uh, ones that are uh, easier, faster to print, uh, generally, to ones that are uh, slower to print and uh, less free. Uh, quite a few on this list. Um, I really suggest that you check out this wiki. Uh, it's got so many great projects. Um, face shields, um, masks, cloth masks. I think the cloth masks section is um, the most useful. Um, some of these are more geared towards um, people that are not in a clinical setting. Um, but I'm sure that you and your neighbors could all use these. Um, if I had bought a sewing machine on day one of this and just sewn masks, um, I think it would have been more effective than even messing with the 3D printers at this point in hindsight. Um, but I don't know how to sew. Uh, so there'd be a learning curve either way.
Uh, the, the section that I really focused on was uh, ventilator splitting, uh, which uh, I was working with the uh, Mass General Brigham's Center for COVID Innovation. And they describe this as the therapeutics section. Um, actually treating um, COVID-19 requires a, essentially a ventilator. There's several designs that I've seen. Um, I mostly focus on the, the vent splitting, as you saw. Uh, but there's some great projects. Um, they ran into a many of the projects ran into a supply chain problem. Um, they were um, using these pressure sensors or um, solenoid valves or something, and it just all got bought up um, during this time. Uh, so many people are trying to build these things. Um, a lot of them just ran out. So uh, using simple designs, um, tends to have the greatest impact with this sort of thing. Um, a really cool thing that uh, I'm sure all of you saw was the uh, Venturi valves that were printed in uh, Italy. Um, now, a lot of people have... Uh, gotten excited about this and said, okay, let's print some valves. Uh, but again, uh, you got to meet the, the demand. Um, no one in the Boston area is looking for a box of 100 3D printed venturi valves that I know of. Um, if that changes, I'll send out an email on the mailing list. Um, but these are really good for testing. If you want to uh, try to build a ventilator at home, um, so that you can work on one of these projects. Um, this first one by uh, Irvana, uh, they have uh, one-way check valves, um, the Venturi valve, the PEEP valve, all in one. Um, and it's public domain. Um, so you can use it, take it, um, modify it. Great. Um, I also want to mention um, Glia. Um, this was a, a really great project. Um, it's a website, glia.org, G-L-I-A.org. Um, they've got a 3D printed stethoscope, a 3D printed tourniquet, um, several really great parts. And they've been in the, at this um, for years trying to just bring a 3D printer to um, places where normally you can't get medical supplies. Um, incredible work. Um, I've talked a little bit about the software. Um, I've used OpenSCAD and FreeCAD. Uh, Blender is another one. Uh, Blender had quite a bit of a learning curve. Um, implicit CAD, I couldn't get to work on my uh, my old version of uh, Triscoll. Um, I didn't try Solve Space, uh, but I definitely use Cura. Um, Octoprint is an interesting one. Um, it allows you to create a server. Uh, using Python that you can monitor your 3D printer with um, on the network. So um, the way that I started learning 3D printing was I connected a computer to uh, the 3D printer, and then I had the, the slicing software monitor the print progress. Um, using this um, OctoPrint, I can just uh, I can slice. Uh, the STL file into G code on any computer. Um, and then I can upload that on a, a web portal and uh, start the print job. And I can attach a webcam to the machine and monitor the progress uh, 
as long as I'm on my home network. Uh, that's really helped me out as far as uh, convenience goes. I don't have to have uh, my dedicated uh, slicing machine uh, just watching a print job. Uh, I haven't used these other ones. Uh, these were submitted by community members. Uh, Fever map, uh, symptom radar, open trace. Uh, GNU Health, uh, Sean showed me this one. Uh, it's a great hospital database program. Uh, it's an alternative to EPIC, which is commonly used in the uh, New England hospital systems. Really hope to see this project take off. Um, the, the last section, efforts, is split into uh, different states, uh, different countries that are working on this, um, solving the pandemic. Uh, most of the links that I've posted are uh, from Massachusetts, but several people in the community have edited the wiki to um, show what they are working on as well. Uh, that's most of what I had. Um, I'd like to thank the Free Software Foundation and GNU, um, OpenSCAD, FreeCAD, uh, Octoprint, uh, the Mass Comfort Strap, uh, LRT, uh, I made the Hackers and Hospitals uh, logo with uh, logos by Nick. Um, that's a, a channel on a proprietary network, but if you use this NVIDIA link, you can watch it with free software only. Um, GIMP and Image Magic made these slides. Um, thank you, Big Blue Button, for making this wonderful platform that we're all using today. Uh, thank you, Privacy Safe, for inviting me. Uh, and. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my family. Uh, this is my daughter. Um, she's been learning how to use an XO1 from the um, One Laptop Per Child project. Um, I think it's really helped her um, learn letters and numbers and uh, how to say things. Uh, she doesn't really know how to um, spell yet, but I think it's helped a little bit. Uh, she's able to turn it on. Uh, pretty incredible. Uh, this is my contact info. Uh, I've got my email, my, my crypto key. Uh, I'm a IRC on, uh, I'm Tom Zane on Freenode IRC. Um, here's my Mastodon. Uh, this project is uh, licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Like license. Um, I'm sure there's some questions. So, uh, how are you doing, Sean? Cool. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Um, we've got a few questions coming through on uh, both private channels and um, I think some public ones as well. Uh, but I want to thank you, of course, for uh, talking about the importance of doing maker stuff uh, in this environment. Um, so before I dig into questions that other people have, you know, something that I've been thinking a lot about um, and sort of have been seeing is uh, how this crisis contrasts with the recession that we had, you know, approximately 10 years or so ago, uh, 10 plus years ago. Um, the whole idea of doing hardware hacking and so on has been around for a really long time, but we saw it take off in the idea of maker spaces and taking crafts and putting them in a communal area. Um, do you see that kind of growing from this, um, or do you see you know it being institutionalized or what? It's it's been kind of weird to me to see it part be part of the conversation, I guess. So. It's definitely gotten more attention uh, to this whole pandemic. Um, 
the tricky part is with social distancing, um, getting together with a bunch of like-minded people at a hackerspace is a little more difficult. Um, now, you can always work you know, seven feet away from each other or so, but um, what I've been telling the people that I know with 3D printers uh, is to try to take them, uh, if you have access, uh, home with you. Um, now that doesn't really that suggestion doesn't really work for a makerspace, but it works for um, a school classroom where the the school is going to be closed for the rest of the year. Um, yeah, I, I love makerspaces. Uh, I've seen some really interesting projects come out of them. Um, our uh, Cambridge uh, Somerville uh, Artisans Asylum uh, has been working on making uh, medical gowns that could be produced, uh, manufactured. Um, the common thing is uh, the face shields. Um, I don't have a laser cutter for the, the clear sheets, so I can't really work on that one. Um, but I could maybe make the, the, the headband piece. Um, but yeah, I love maker spaces. Um, that's pretty much what I did at the Boys and Girls Club. I was, uh, teaching kids how to make things. Awesome. Um, so it's not surprising, obviously, that this is coming out of the Free Software Foundation um, and that area of Boston where people are always thinking about um, social issues, plus free software, plus you know how to actually do some real charity and get stuff out there. So that's amazing. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting uh, about what's going on is um, it contrasts, uh, or at least has some parallels, I guess I should say, to the way that free and open source software collaboration happens. Um, for example, what we used to call drive-by contributors, or more nicely, event-based volunteers or whatever, you know, you have a project, right? You write some software that people like, um, it gets a lot of traction, and all of a sudden everybody loves it, and they want to help, right? But keeping right. that momentum up is hard, um, as you've sort of alluded to with this, uh, making sure you're getting the right stuff to the right people um, can be kind of hard. So how do you see this sort of going in the future? Um, do you envision some feedback me mechanisms? And have you seen healthcare workers sort of come into the fold, so to speak, and want to get involved with free software? Um, so, I've seen a lot of um, organizations try to jump on board with this concept. Um, I've seen a lot of them do it uh, correctly, and I've seen a lot of them do it incorrectly. Um, uh, one thing that I saw was um, a company designed a part, put it online, and said, it's open source. and it was just the part, it wasn't the, the work files, and open source isn't a license. Uh, so they still technically had copyright over it. So if you actually took that part and you made a change to it and released it, you'd still have to get permission from them, and they could say no. And then you would have put some work into a thing that didn't go anywhere. Uh, it's really important uh, with all these projects that people don't need to ask permission. Uh, you want to have it licensed so that anyone can take it if they find it, uh, make a change to it, and publish it again. Um, this is all about speed. Um, if you have to ask an organization and they have to ask their management, uh, do we let this makerspace modify our part? Uh, that's all wasted time. Um, and if, if we're trying to fight a, a massive uh, influx uh, that will overload hospitals, uh, time is very critical. So these, these uh, free culture, free software licenses are very important uh, in this concept. Um, this is a great example why, why they're helpful uh, in general. Mm. 
So uh, one of the things that's happened in my own life is uh, people have been reaching out to me as sort of an open source, free and open source software in this context. But of course, the public uses the term open source in general. Um, but anyway, they've been like, oh, Sean's the open source guy, right? Um, and I've had some folks reach out to me saying, well, we've got this software that does X, right? Um, and uh, one group of Yale students, for example, is doing an inventory uh, app for PPE, right? And the idea is, well, you're a charity or you're some kind of clinic or, or some smaller organization, and all of a sudden you're faced with this task of having a massive amount of inventory of PPE, which is a good problem to have, right? But right. something <laughs> these groups are not used to, right? Um, so, you know, when you get this stuff and when you're able to have this stuff, you know, it can create these kinds of, you know, challenges of scale, I guess I would say. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, I helped this one group I'm thinking about um, license their stuff under the Afero GPL. I made sure it was all, right. you know, as kosher as it could be. Um, are you seeing that inside the FSF? Are people looking towards the Free Software Foundation to be that sort of guiding light? Um, and if it hasn't happened yet, is that something that the organization is thinking about? Um, so I'm not on the licensing team, uh, so I don't see all of those tickets that come in uh, with that purpose. Um, in general, uh, people reach out to the FSF for licensing questions and help um, all the time. Uh, in this specific case, um, I'm not sure. Um, one part of outreach that I've done is if I, uh, a lot of people have been sending me projects. Um, and uh, if I see a project that uh, they've released everything, uh, I'll make an issue and say, this, this is great. Um, did you know that not having a license means that it's copyright? And then I'll suggest, uh, I suggest the, the GPL v3 or the AGPL v3 if you would like some help with this, I can I can make a pull request. And typically, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, let's go GPL. And uh, I've gotten uh, many projects to um, freely license their project uh, just by creating a pull request and copying and pasting my little thing of text. Um, I'd like to see more of that. Um, anyone can take that concept and go out on all the different version control system websites and spread free software licenses. Sure, and I think now um, it, it's very interesting and, and wonderful that people are seeing that the fundamental idea of sharing is so important, right? Um, to handle crises, but also um, to make sure that you have compatibility between, you know, disparate efforts, right? Um, so I guess um, a question I sort of have, but I'm seeing different versions of, um, is let's say I come up with a 3D printer design or I find something on Thingiverse or one of those other sites um, and I download it. Um, how should I license that? Where should I put it? And um, how do I get it to you all so that it's something useful? Right. Um, so for this um, Hackers and Hospitals wiki, um, I'm not specifying a specific place that I want you to put it. Um, but it's really important that you put it somewhere. Um, it could be any of those that you listed. Um, it could be any of the version control systems. Um, put it out there, freely license it, and then link to it from all the different places, um, all the social medias, uh, the Hackers and Hospitals Wiki, um, wherever you find people that are trying to do this sort of thing. If they are into this, send them your project. Uh, if you just post it somewhere and you don't tell anybody about it, just going to sit there, probably. 
but you would say, for example, a, a Creative Commons uh, attribution share alike would suffice for this kind of file, or should it be a software license, or or how would you license it if you have to write up a README that says that? So I personally use uh, Creative Commons attribution share alike. Um, I tend to use um, whatever the other project used. Um, so the uh, the mask strap that I modified, I think it was CC BY. I, I released my single part of their two part as CC BY as well. Um, I also use the same website that they used. Um, I tried to not change platforms. Um, but if a platform is too difficult uh, to publish on, um, publish it anywhere. Uh, just make sure that you, you follow the, the license of the original project. Um, if it's attribution, tell people where you got it. Um, now, you don't have to do that with the, the CC0 uh, public domain. Um, you could change the license to something uh, less permissive. Um, you could go uh, GPL from there, or uh, Creative Commons Attribution, or Creative Commons Attribution Share alike. Um, that can also work in, in a negative way. Um, if you make a public domain part, uh, might end up in a proprietary system in three months or a year. and. They may never tell you. They may modify it, fix it, make it perfect, and they would just keep it to themselves. Uh, that sort of thing happens a lot in the software world. Um, sure. So uh, I guess that's something we, we can kind of leave off on. But uh, for anybody who's listening, um, it's really important to keep things copy left, meaning that you're replenishing the commons if you can do that. Um, because otherwise, you know, as Michael says, you can make something, somebody can run off with it, and basically leech off the community and not have to give back, um, which is not only bad in general, but in this specific context can be really dangerous. So, Right, it's, it's all about building a community out of your part. Um, the permissive licenses don't support that uh, concept. But it's at least something. Um, I'd rather have something uh, public domain than not at all. That's right. Don't look at gift horse in the mouth, so to speak, right? Um, right, right. Okay, well, thank you so much, Michael. Um, all your uh, contact info is up on the screen. Uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in. And uh, if you want to help with the Hackers and Hospitals initiative, um, go out to the Libra Planet Wiki. Um, there's already been some press around it, so you can probably find it by searching the web. So uh, with that, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a little break, break here before the next speaker, okay? All right. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I'll be on the, um, the chats if you have any more questions.